Chapter Eight of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Eight: An Atmosphere of Love. After the fierce northeast wind came one from the southeast, whose wings were laden with moisture and which cast cold showers over the earth. It is said that a breath from this quarter brings a downpour that continues unintermittently for forty-eight hours. On this occasion, however, the rain was not incessant. The sky lowered when it did not send down its showers, and these latter were cold and unfertilizing. February field dyke, March dry it up, is the saying, but March this year was one of rain, and February had been a month of warmth and sunshine, which had forced on all vegetation, which March was cutting with its cruel frosts and beating down with its pitiless rains. That had come about in Coombe cellars which might have been anticipated. Kate had been sent across the water with the scantiest provision against cold, and with no instruction as to how to act in the event of delay of the atmospheric train. She was not a strong child, and the bitter cold had cut her to the marrow. On the morning following she was unable to rise, and by night she was in a burning fever. Kate had an attic room where there was no grate, a room lighted by a tiny window that looked east across the river. Against the panes the rain pattered, and the water dripped from the eaves upon the window ledge with the monotonous sound of the death watch. Hard by was the well head of a fall pipe, in which birds had made their nests, and so had choked it that the water, unable to descend by the pipe, squirted and plashed heavily on the slates below. A candle, brought from the kitchen, stood on the window-shelf guttering in the wind that found its way through the ill-fitting lattice and cracked diamond panes. It cast but an uncertain shimmer over the face of the sick girl. On the floor stood an iron rushlight holder, the sides pierced with round holes. In this a feeble rushlight burned slowly. Beside the bed sat Mrs. Pepperill, and the old rector of Coombe and Tynehead stood with bowed head, so as not to knock his crown against the ceiling, looking intently at the girl. Zara was uneasy. Her conscience reproached her. She had acted inconsiderately, if not wrongly, in sending her niece across the water. She was afraid lest she should be blamed by the parson, and lest her conduct should be commented on by the parish. She reasoned with herself, without being able thoroughly to still the qualms of her conscience. What cause had she to suppose that the train would not arrive punctually? How could she have foreseen that it would come in so late that it made it impossible for Kate to cross in the then condition of the tide? Had John Pook arrived but ten minutes earlier than he did, then, unquestionably, the boat would have come over, if not at Coombe Cellars, yet somewhat lower down the river. She was not gifted with the prophetic faculty— she had so many things to occupy her mind that she could not provide for every contingency. Should the child die, no blame, no reasonable blame, could attach to her. The fault lay with Mr. Brunel, who had laid down the atmospheric railway, with the engineer at the Tymouth exhausting pump, who had not done his duty properly, with the guard of the train, who had not seen that the rollers for opening and closing the valves did their work properly, with John Pook for delaying over his hat, that he had let fall, with Jason Quorm for not offering to ferry the boat in place of his daughter, instead of staying over the fire with her husband, filling his head with mischievous nonsense about making money out of mud, and sinking capital which would never come to the surface again. Finally, the fault lay with Providence, that blind and inconsiderate power which had robbed her of Wilmot, and now had not retarded the ebb by ten minutes, which might easily have been effected by shifting the direction of the wind to the southwest. The feeble light flickered in the window, and almost in the same manner did the life of the girl flicker, burning itself away as the candle guttered in the overmuch and irregular heat, now quivering under the inrush of draught, hissing blue and faint and ready to expire, then flaring up in exaggerated incandescence. The cheeks flushed, the eyes burned with unnatural light, and the pulse ebbed and flowed. "'Where do the stars go by day?' asked Kate, in delirium. "'And why does the plough turn in heaven? Is God's hand on it?' "'My child,' said the parson, 
God's plow in the earth is the frost, that cuts deep and turns and crumbles the clods ready for the seed. And God's plow on human hearts is great sorrow and sharp disappointment, to make the necessary furrow into which to drop the seeds of faith and love and patience. She is not speaking to you, sir, said Mrs. Pepperell. She is talking rambling like, but she is terrible at questions, always. The clergyman held his hands folded behind his back and looked intently at the fevered face. The eyes were bright, but not with intelligence. Kate neither recognized him nor understood what he said. I wonder now where the doctor is, said Zara. I reckon he has gone to some patient who can pay a guinea where we pay seven shillings and sixpence. Dr. Mant will be with such twice a day. As we are poor, he will come to us only now and then. You judge harshly. You have but just sent for him. I did not think Kate was bad enough to need a doctor. God is the great physician. Put your trust in him. That is what you said when Wilmot was ill. I lost her all the same. It was the will of heaven. God's plough, maybe, was needed. In what way did I deserve to be so treated? My beautiful child, my own, very, very own child. Zara's eyes filled, but her lips contracted, making crow feet at the corners. I have had left to me instead this cold-hearted creature, my niece, who can in no way make up to me for what I have lost. I've had a sovereign taken from me, and a halfpenny left in my hand. God has given you this child to love and care for. For his own wise purposes he took away Wilmot, whom you were spoiling with overmuch affection and blind admiration. Now he would have you love and cherish the treasure he has left in your hands. Treasure? I, treasure, love her. Of course I love her. I do my duty by her. You have done your duty. Of that I have no doubt. But how have you done it? Do you know, Mrs. Pepperell, that there are two ways in which everything may be done, as a duty to God, in the spirit of bondage, or in the spirit of love? So with regard to the image of God in this innocent and suffering child, you may do your duty perfunctorily or in charity. I do it in charity. Her father has not paid a penny for her keep. That is not what I mean. Charity is the spirit of love. There are two minds in which man may stand before God, to everything, to every one. There is the servant mind and the filial mind, the duty mind and the mind of love. And with what mind have you treated this child? The parson put his hand to Kate's brow and drew back from it the dark hair, sweeping the locks aside with his trembling fingers. Look, said he, what a forehead she has got, what a brow, full, full, full of thought. This is no common head. There is no vulgar brain in this poor little skull. Wilmot had a head and brains, said Mrs. Pepperell, and her forehead was higher and whiter. Zira's conscience was stinging her. What the rector said was true, and the consciousness that it was true made her angry. Would she have sent Wilmot across the water insufficiently protected against the east wind? Would she have done this without weighing the chances of the atmospheric railway breaking down? If death were to snatch this child from her, she would ever feel that same responsibility had weighed on her, However much she might shift the blame, some of it must adhere to her. She had not been kind to the motherless girl. It was true that she had not been unkind to her, but then Kate had a right to a share of her heart. She had valued her niece chiefly as a foil to her daughter, and when the latter died, her feelings toward Kate had been dipped in wormwood. Zara was not a bad woman, but she was a disappointed woman, she was disappointed in her husband, disappointed in her child. Her heart was not congealed, nor was her conscience dead, but both were in a torpid condition. Now, as by the glimmer of the swaling candle she looked on the suffering girl, the ice around her heart cracked. A warm gush of pity, an ache of remorse, came upon her. She bowed and kissed the arch brow of her niece. The rector knelt and prayed in silence. He loved the intelligent girl in his Sunday school, the nightingale in his church choir. 
Zira obeyed his example. Then both heard the stair creak, and a heavy tread sounded on the boards. Mrs. Pepperell looked round, but the irregular tread would have told her who had entered the attic chamber without the testimony of her eyes. She stood up and signed to Jason Quarm to be less noisy in his movements. Puh, said he, it's nothing. Kitty will get over it. You, Zira, are tough. I am tough. Leather toughness is the characteristic of us Quarms. When she is better, send her to me, to the moor. That will set her up. The rector rose. Jason went to the head of the bed and laid his large hand on the sick girl's brow. The coolness of his palm seemed to do her good. "'You see, it comforts the little toad,' said her father. "'There is nothing to alarm you in the case. Children are like corks. They go under water and are up again. Mostly up. Dipping under is temporary. Temporary and soon over. Parson, do you want to speculate?' I am buying oak, dirt cheap, to sell at a tremendous profit, ten per cent at the least. What do you say? The rector shook his head. Well, I shouldn't go away from Coombe with Kitty ill, but that I expect to make my fortune and hers. She'll have a dower some day out of the Brimps oaks. Then the man stumped out of the room and down the steep stairs. Jason Quorum was always sanguine. Do you think Kitty will live? asked Sarah, who did not share his views. "'I trust so,' answered the rector. "'If she does, then regard her as a gift from heaven. Once before she was put, a frail and feeble object, into your arms to rear and cherish. You were then too much engrossed in your daughter to give this child your full attention. Your own Wilmont has been taken away. Now your niece has been almost withdrawn from you. But the hand that holds the issues of life and death spares her.' She is committed to you once more, again helpless, frail, and committed to you that you may envelop her in an atmosphere of love. I have loved her, said Mrs. Pepperell. This is the second time, sir, that you have charged me with lack of love towards Kate. Wilmot, said the rector, was one who stormed the heart. She went up against it, with flags flying and martial music, and broke in at the point of the bayonet. Kate's nature is different. She will storm no heart. She sits on the doorstep as a beggar, and does not even knock and solicit admission. Throw open your door, extend your hand, and the timid child will falter in, frightened, yet elate with hope. I don't know, said Zira meditatively. You'll excuse me saying it, but when a child is heartless— Heartless? Who is heartless? Kate, to be sure— Heartless, repeated the rector. You are in grievous error. No child is heartless. None of God's creatures are void of love. God is love himself, and we are all made in the image of the Creator. In all of us is the divine attribute of love. We were made to love and to be loved. It is a necessity of our nature. This poor little spirit, with how much love has it been suckled, with how much has its nakedness been clothed? The cream of your heart's affection was given to your own daughter, and only the way, thin and somewhat assiduated, offered to the niece. Turn over a new leaf, Mrs. Pepperell. Treat this child in a manner different from that in which she has been treated. I allow frankly that you have not been unkind, unjust, ungracious, but such a soul as this cannot flower in an atmosphere of negatives. You know something about the principles on which the atmospheric railway acts, do you not, Mrs. Pepperell? There is a pump which exhausts the air. Now put a plant, an animal, into a vessel from which the vital air has been withdrawn, and plant or animal will die at once. It has been given nothing deleterious, nothing poisonous has been administered, it dies simply because it has been deprived of that atmosphere in which God ordained that it should live and flourish. My good friend, said the rector, and his voice shook with mingled tenderness of feeling and humor, if I were to take you up and set you under the exhausting apparatus and work at the pump, you would gasp, gasp and die. The woman turned cold and blank at the suggestion. If I did that, 
continued the parson, the coroner who sat on you would pronounce that you had been murdered by me. I should be sent to the assizes, and should infallibly be hung. Very well. There are other kinds of murder than killing the body. There is the killing of the noble, divine nature in man, and that not by acts of violence only, but by denial of what is essential to its existence. Remember this, Mrs. Pepperell, what the atmosphere is to the lungs, that love is to the heart. God created the lungs to be inflated with air, and the heart to be filled with love. End of chapter 8